Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. I only have 12 minutes. I'm going to spend some of my 12 minutes praising Sir Vince Cable. I can only hope he will do the same for me. <laughs> While he was at Shell, he helped to pioneer scenario-based planning. This is a way of thinking which was unique at the time. It's a way of thinking about the unthinkable. Later on, the American Pentagon and the CIA stole this concept. I myself use it in my own book, The 100-Year Marathon. The concept is devilishly simple. Try to think of different factors that will determine the future. Make a plan of where, let's say, four or five of them are, so-called family of scenarios, and then change some of the variables to see what unthinkable things might happen. In the case of China, as far as I know, nobody in Washington, D.C. did this in 1970, 1971, as Kissinger and Nixon were preparing to open China. If there had been a Shell Company scenario done at the time, 1970 and 71, and I had some input into the decision, so I blame myself in part, although I blame Dr. Kissinger even more, the scenario could have been, are we being deceived? Is it not America opening up China, which we thought it was, is it China opening up America? <coughs> for all kinds of benefits to China. And at the time, a recently declassified document shows Henry Kissinger knew there were radicals in China. In July 1970, he received a highly classified report that said Chinese fighter aircraft have been launched and are flying out possibly to shoot down an American reconnaissance plane. By the way, this is not 1990, this is 1970. And Kissinger writes a memo to Nixon saying there are apparently radicals in the Chinese leadership who do not want an opening with America. Perhaps we should be sure our reconnaissance aircraft don't fly too close to the China coast. coast. The point here is already the American side understood there's politics at the top in Beijing. There are radicals who are able to launch fighter aircraft. Later on, in a very famous comment Chairman Mao made to Nixon, which Nixon acknowledged he didn't fully understand at the time, Chairman Mao had a way of speaking almost like a poet. And he would say things sometimes his young translator couldn't accurately translate. One of the things he said to Nixon was, there are some people here who didn't want you to come to China. Don't worry about it. The top 10 generals in China a few months earlier had been killed or placed under arrest and would be sentenced to life in prison or execution for opposing the opening to America. More recently, the Chinese have released a number of memoirs that show how it was their idea to open America. So if you have a title like Mr. President Xie has selected, Dancing with the Dragon, you need to understand first who invited who to dance. We always thought it was us, the noble, magnanimous Americans seeking a program of globalization, saw this angry, hostile, closed China, and decided to open it up to join the world. That view is now obsolete. People recognize the new Chinese materials. Even Kissinger, in his book on China, he says it took him 40 years to write this book. He now has abandoned the story that America opened China. He now, in his new book on China, that's the title, On China, you should all buy it. He now says there was a parallel effort inside the Chinese leadership to reach out to us this changes the whole perception that the West has sought to bring China into the new world order. If I skip forward to just a couple of years ago, you all know that many countries in the world have accused China of intellectual property violations. 
In Geneva, there's an organization. It's a big, beautiful green and blue glass skyscraper. For short, among insiders, it's called WIPO. Doesn't sound very nice, does it? WIPO. Who knows what that stands for? Put your hands up. Oh boy, five. WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's part of the family of UN specialized agencies, of which there are 16, which in turn go back to the League of Nations, which in turn go back even further. It's the idea of a world order and various functional issues like the protection of intellectual property will be managed in a way that, some, that involves pooling the sovereignty of 100 or more nations. Who ran to be the new director of the World Intellectual Property Organization? Put your hands up if you think it was an English person. How about an American? How about the winning vote was held by a Chinese citizen and party member? Takes a lot of gall to be accused of the biggest intellectual property theft in the world in the history of mankind, and then to run a candidate to head the UN specialized agencies. He was going to win. President Trump heard about this and said, wait a minute, this isn't right, and consulted with a lot of others. Suddenly, a candidate from Singapore, with the long history of the protection of intellectual property, put his name in and won. So going back to 1970, all the way to 2020, has the American plan to dance with the dragon and bring China in to the UN system, the World Order, the World Bank, IMF? Has it worked? You bet. Is it what we plan for? No. And in Sir Vince Cable's book called Money and Power, you will find a chapter on Deng Xiaoping, the great Chinese leader, now somewhat eclipsed by Xi Jinping, and how he learned from his time in Russia, and later on from the World Bank and a Nobel laureate named James Tubin, he learned the plan for how to turn China into an economic powerhouse. The United States and the West and Japan all helped this. Again, with the assumption, dancing with the dragon is going to be a good date. No, it turned out that China with human rights practices, censorship practices, a permanent one-party system, the use of terror against its own people, this China, the one Kissinger thought about in 1970 when he mentioned the radicals are sending the jet fighter out, this kind of China seems to be the winners in Beijing. And my book, 100 Year Marathon, using the scenario techniques Sir Vince Cable pioneered, says, what does this mean? If we were so wrong the last 20 to 40 years, what exactly is the nature of China's ambition? Is it Hitler and Nazi Germany taking over Poland and Czech? No, absolutely not. No indication of that kind of conduct at all from China. Is it some sort of um, Japan, 1930s, assassinating leaders, trying to set up an East Asia co-prosperity sphere? No, no indication of that whatsoever. The Chinese ambition, as they themselves explain it, is just to return to how things used to be. And most Americans, some Oxford students of course know, but not all, well, how did things used to be? And that's led to an exploration for me in my next book on what are the patterns of ancient Chinese politics that Xi Jinping is talking so much about in a kind of a code. He uses proverbs. He uses stories about ancient people that you think that's harmless. But actually, Xi Jinping is being quite frank that he needs a third term, he says, which he may have within hours, third five-year term, to complete the work he has to return China. It's a term that they use kind of like Renaissance. Fu Xing Zhilu. How many of you here, and this is my last few seconds, how many of you here think you have a good picture of the kind of world Xi Jinping has in mind when China is restored to its rightful place? Put your hand up. That means you have to buy my next book. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Well, thank you for inviting me back to the Union. Um, and it's an honour to speak after Dr. P Pillsbury, who is probably one of the two or three people in the world who is most authoritative on China and is, is a deep thinker. Um, and many of the things he says and writes about are wise uh, and right. Um, but I, I sort of part company. Um, in fact, I, I start to part company in the leading article in the book where it talks about China's secret strategy to replace America as the global superpower. I mean, why, why secret? Um, in his book, uh, Dr. Pillsbury describes an episode where a Chinese defector uh, comes to the United States and warns that there is a secret plan to make the Chinese economy as big as that of the United States by the year 2020. And it's a big shock, you know, big secret. <laughs> Well, I mean, I have to tell him that 25 years ago, I was sitting in a multinational company in London, uh, armed with a few statistics, a calculator, and a bit of common sense. Uh, and you could work out um, on the back of an envelope that, that China was almost certain to become the biggest economy in the world by 2020. And it didn't require secrecy to understand that. And this is simple arithmetic, actually. I mean, there are four times as many people in China. You know, when China gets to a quarter of American living standards, by definition, it's going to be equivalent in economic size. I mean, wh why is that a problem? I mean, it, it should be something we welcome, actually. I and mean, a lot of very poor people getting a decent living standard. And, you know, it's basic arithmetic that when China has continued to grow, as it almost certainly will, and it reaches half American living standards, they will have an economy twice as big. And they're going to have to get used to it, and we are. And actually, it's not just China. By the middle of this century, India will also be an economic superpower with a bigger economy than the United States, very probably. So, you know, there is an issue about the, the current hegemon, you know, the superpower, getting used to the idea that there is another country which will have comparable and potentially significantly more economic heft. I mean, we, you know, Britain used to be number one 100 years ago, so we've had a century to get used to sliding down the league table. I think we're about now about number eight. We've just been overtaken by Indonesia. But, you know, we, we, we get used to these things. And I, I, I think the United States, the, the core of the problem in many ways is an inability to get used to this basic fact and to adapt to it and to accept that China is going to have to be integrated within the, the, the rules of the world system, which the United States has led and led well to our, all, to our benefit for the last 70 years. Now, this whole idea of secrecy, I think, cuts across the idea that many of the features of modern China are hidden in plain sight. Now, it's very clear what they're about. Um, it's not hidden. Um, the idea that the Chinese model, which was developed, the modern Chinese model under Deng Xiaoping, uh, it was very clear from the outset that there were two very basic principles. The first was the emphasis on stability and security. After a century of chaos, uh, the revolution, the civil war, the war, Mao Zedong's madness, um, security under an authoritarian one-party state was never hidden. It was always absolutely clear that this was the model that they were going to pursue. And the second aspect was raising Chinese living standards, which was going to happen by importing capitalism into China, which has happened, state capitalism, a big private sector, the top end under some state control, but with very dynamic capitalist competitive system, and state enterprises with an element of market competition. And the stark capitalist model has worked in China. It's been highly successful. Uh, it may now run into trouble. Um, they've got a lot of economic problems associated with underconsumption, corporate debt. Um, but of course, if they do run into trouble, um, they'll become like Japan and we no longer worry about them. But actually, the, the issue which we now face is that if the Chinese model continues to be successful, this combination of 
rapid growth sustained by a successful capitalist system allied to an authoritarian one-party state, what is the problem in our having to try and live with that? Now, some of you will say, um, well, democracy, you know, we believe in democracy, why shouldn't China be a democracy? Well, it is a different system, and hitherto, you know, we've accepted that there is a different system. Um, to take a, a particular issue which concerns the British, which is our residual responsibilities in Hong Kong, and people here are routely very upset, worse than upset, angry that decent people are being bundled off to prison and newspaper editors are being shut down. But I have to say, the Chinese always made it absolutely clear what the red lines were in Hong Kong. When Margaret Thatcher went to negotiate with Deng Xiaoping 40 years ago, uh, he said, look, we could have dealt with Hong Kong the way the Indians dealt with uh, colonial enclaves or Indonesia, sent the army in, problem solved in 24 hours. But they didn't. They were more subtle. They saw advantages in keeping this independent entity. Uh, but he said, look, there are certain parameters you, you can say what you like, free speech, you can criticize the Communist Party, but if there is violent disorder, we will move in and stop it. And those people in Hong Kong who, in the name of democracy and free speech, started throwing Molotov cocktails at the police and vandalizing their legislature, did their little bit to kill Hong Kong democracy. Because it was very clear what the rules of the game were. And the Chinese were not in any way dishonest or unclear about what was permissible. And I think we need to remember that. And similarly, in terms of foreign policy, um, President Xi's now been there for 10 years. He set out his approach very clearly 10 years ago, and we accepted it. And it was set out in a statement he made in Mexico City, he was asked about, what's your relationship going to be with the West? He said, look, we're not going to export revolution. We're not going to export hungry refugees. We're not going to mess with you. Don't mess with us. And it's a bit crude, but it's very clear how to engage with China, which is to accept, if you want to have a good relationship with them, you respect their principle of, self, of uh, territorial integrity and non-interference. And that's the basis on which they've since conducted their foreign affairs. It's why, for example, in the, the issue of Xinjiang, um, terrible human rights abuse, I'm quite sure, but, and the West has uh, taken up a strong position on it. But it's very clear that a lot of other countries in the world by the Chinese argument. Every single Muslim country of importance, including those that are democratically elected, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, have lined up on the Chinese side. So that, that, that principle of dealing with China, engaging with China, but recognizing the reality that they have a different system and they're not going to countenance interference with their internal politics, that has to be, out of sheer realism, the way we deal with them. So let me just try and bring to a head where I think this leads. I mean, I was part of a government that, where we did try to engage with China, and our primary motive was economic. And we took the view, and I, I would still take the view, that it was economically beneficial to Britain and other Western countries to engage economically with China. As a result of what we did, uh, we still have a British steel industry. A Chinese company bought out Tata Steel and it was going to close. We will have an electric vehicle industry because the Chinese are going to invest heavily in batteries in the northeast of England. Jag Land Rover is a highly successful motor car industry in, in the West Midlands because of the profits and the sales in China. AstraZeneca, which developed our vaccine, did so on the back of profits and sales in China. British universities, including this one, depend very heavily on 120,000 Chinese students every year paying full commercial fees. You know, the British economy has benefited from our relations with China, and I don't apologize for having negotiated some of those things. 
But the, it, it isn't just parochial, there's a broader picture. Despite all the complaints about Chinese unfair practices, they've actually helped to keep the world monetary system stable. They hold four trillion dollars worth of US assets. It was always going to be said that they would use it to sabotage the system and they were going for currency warfare. Nothing of the kind has happened. They've kept the basic monetary system stable in implicit partnership with the United States. The person who put the boot into the rules-based system, the World Trade Organization, wasn't the Chinese. It was President Trump trying to cut it off at the knees, uh, withdrawing support for the WTO. And Michael refers quite fairly to some of the grievances which we have with the Chinese about intellectual property rights. I mean, all countries coming up, developing, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and I have to say, in its early stages, the United States, which based its development stealing um, intellectual property from Britain. And that was how they got going. I mean, that's how countries start. Uh, but they have now introduced intellectual property courts. Foreign companies are now winning cases. They are adapting to the demands of a globally responsible economic partner. Uh, we complain. Um, we used to negotiate with the Chinese and say, well, you open your market, show that you're willing to reciprocate fr free trade. And the top of the Western list and the British list was always financial services. And it's worth noting that in the current flurry of uh, activity that's taking place in China on policy, that one of the things that the president has done is to open up China to financial services. Leading Western companies, BlackRock, JP Morgan, are now operating fully owned subsidiaries in China. Uh, buying up Chinese shares. You know, they've accepted the obligations of being part of an integrated economic system. But I'll, I'll conclude around remark with something that's more important than international trade, which is those common headaches, you know, the economists call international public goods, where countries have to cooperate. You know, pandemics are one example. Um, the other is in Glasgow at the moment, is climate change. And the Chinese are currently being portrayed as the bad guys. And they have very large emissions, of course, but not in actually in per capita terms or cumulatively. But yeah, the, the, we, we're not going to solve the, the climate problem without Chinese cooperation. And they do recognize there is a problem. They've just introduced carbon pricing. Uh, they've got the biggest renewable energy industry, the electric vehicle industry in the world. Um, they tried to accelerate the phasing out of coal and then run into power shortages, so they've had to backtrack, but they understand the necessity. But the key point is we're not going to solve this problem unless we work with them on research, common standards, and so on. And you can't do that in a Cold War environment. And, and, and just my final point, and I'll just take a minute over this, is the proliferation of nuclear weapons, probably the biggest danger we face at the moment. And there are rogue states, North Korea, you know, Pakistan, potentially, Iran. Uh, China has influence with all those countries. We don't know how they exercise it. But we could potentially minimize the risks associated with that if we're willing to work with the Chinese. And something even more serious, because of the collapse of conversations with China, a, a, a sort of paranoia has now developed, which is leading the Chinese to build up their stock of nuclear weapons. They had a minimum deterrence policy, no first use, there was no threat to anybody. Now they fear they're going to be attacked by the United States, so they're building up their nuclear arsenal. I mean, you can argue about who's to blame, but it's got to be stopped. It's very, very dangerous. And you only stop it if you talk to them. And nobody is now talking to them. And we have to engage for our, our own sakes as well as theirs. But thank you. So, Michael, could I turn to you and ask a question which I sometimes think isn't asked enough in Washington, D.C., although I suspect that you've probably asked it more than once. And I'm going to put it to you this way. This is, a what, trick, this is a trick question, right? Not at all. It's a question to which you, as an immense expert, uh, the greatest expert on China, according to President Trump, no, uh, no less. And goodness knows he went through a few during his, uh, his time. How is Steve Bannon doing? But during that time, a lot of questions were asked about how can we stop China? How can we contain China? How can we essentially prevent China doing you know, lots of things which many people in the outside world 
in Asia, not even you know, Europeans or Americans, might worry about. Um, militarization of the South China Sea, uh, the question of whether Taiwan is vulnerable. All of these debates are still very current. So those questions have been asked quite frequently. The flip side question, which I've heard answered much less frequently, and I'll put to you now, is this. What would you say is the clearly defined role that China ought to have in its region and beyond globally? Because as Vince has said, you know, it's not going to be a liberal democracy and we shouldn't particularly expect that it will be. It is a very large, powerful, influential country. It's built up its economy to the second biggest economy in the world. It is the largest single market in terms of population anywhere in the world. It has surely a right to put forward some sort of idea about its own position that is not purely defined by what other countries think about it. So if you would agree with that premise, what is it that China's role should be in the Asia Pacific region and beyond if it's not the things it's doing now that Washington wants to push back against? Imagine it's the Oxford Union, 1935. Not, not hard to mistake, or I have to say. And you asked the same question about what the Economist magazine referred to in those years as Mr. Hitler, Mr. Hitler. Churchill, by the way, is portrayed as an idiot, ignoramus, stupid fool in the 30s by the Economist. But Mr. Hitler was assumed to have a legitimate grievance that he sought to uh, rectify. And British opinion at the time was in favor of Mr. Hitler. The Versailles Treaty was unfair. The reparations were unfair. There's quite a long list. So there were some British at the time who said, Hitler has legitimate goals. We can't just try to constrain him or essentially be mean to him. Why, he might get even nastier. The, this view was so wrong that it cost the lives of millions of people. And now you ask me, and everybody should ask themselves, mm -hmm. what is a legitimate role for China that we could all agree to? Yeah, we That's people, we people outside China. Yeah. So you have a list. There's actually, there really is a list. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese spokesman just recently referred to the list that the Biden administration has presented to China. There's also a list that China presented to us. The same thing happened in the Trump administration during the trade talks. The Chinese actually physically gave our side a list. Uh, one example is, uh, had to do with data uh, facilitating the Chinese version of Amazon operating inside the United States. One of many, many, almost 50 items. We had our list. So when you raise this kind of question, it raises the issue of what tools what steps, what measures do governments have to implement this kind of vision of what China should be like? I would think that list would include stop the so-called genocide of the Uyghurs in a verifiable way. Admit the program is over, close the doors, let the Uyghurs out. This helps China in terms of values with a role that they can play in the world we treat our Muslims with respect. The list could also include, Sir Vince mentioned, I agree with him, the nuclear weapons issue. China was invited June 1999 to Vienna to meet the American and Russian delegations to discuss a trilateral agreement for a lower cap on nuclear weapons. China refused to attend. The Americans even put out Chinese flags in the conference room, the Russians agreed China should come to the nuclear weapons talks, specifically on strategic stability and how not to have accidents among nuclear powers. China refused to come. So Sir Vince wants you to believe that somehow the Americans are not opening up a conversation with China. No, there's a quite a long list of events they won't come to. So their regional role right now is very much uh, a matter of controversy in all the capitals in Asia. Joe Biden has continued most of Donald Trump's China policies. There's a good reason for this. When he and his team got into office, they examined China's record. It's not just genocide against the Uyghurs. It's not just intellectual property violations. 
It's not just tripling the number of nuclear weapons. It's much more than that. And our narrow, selfish American view, which I don't expect anybody in Great Britain to agree with, is we don't want to give up our primacy in the world lightly. You may all say, oh, let China have a chance. We British had 100 years or more of primacy. We wrote the rules of the road. The Americans took were number one for a while. Let's give China a chance. My suggestion is this is a highly dangerous thing for everybody else, but for Americans in particular, giving up our global primacy, a lot of Americans simply won't do it. We'd fight rather than do it. Now, there's some Americans that I was going to mention, uh, Jamie Dimon, head of uh, uh, J.P. Chase, and I'm trying to think of the exact go, go way they phrase it. No. Uh, Jamie Dimon has said recently something Sir Vince said. We Americans must get used to being number two to China, but we'll still be four times richer per capita. I think at right now, Jamie Dimon's view is a minority. In our House and Senate, you'd find very few members of Congress willing to vote. Oh yes, we need to be number two to China. So I don't expect the European support for our maintaining our primacy. That's our business. But what we're gonna have to do may scare a lot of Europeans. We can't let the Chinese try to match us in nuclear weapons. We can't have them flying jet bombers, so-called nuclear equipped jet bombers, around Taiwan whenever their feelings are hurt. So just to understand the central point. So there's no clear vision to answer your question of China's legitimate role as long as China is engaging in such misconduct to be egregiously outraging so just, to most just, people in just, the world. Just to be clear with that, Michael, in a sense, the answer to my question is the role of China is still to be defined by the United States first and foremost. No, by you. You're the one who raised the question, mm. asking an American, what role should China have? How dare I answer that question? This is for China to decide. However, we Americans have the right to respond to what we think is happening. And we have a number of tools at work already the President Biden is continuing. We're going to stop technology theft by China. We're going, to carry, we're going to use a number of tools to slow them down in misconduct. And Biden is all for this. It's nothing to do with just Trump. So let me turn to Sir Vince Cable. And Vince, you'll have heard various things that Michael's put forward, including parallels with the, the 1930s. I'm sure you'll want to address that. Let me put a specific question to you, though, as, as part of that discussion, which is, is, is this. Isn't part of the problem that people have with assessing how to engage with China, to use you know, the phrase that's in, in your book subtitle, I think, that let's say 30 years ago, although there were you know, egregious human rights abuses uh, against um, you know, many uh, dissident lawyers and artists and you know, the Tibetan population and so forth, it took place pretty much entirely within the boundaries of China. But issues such as the militarization of the South China Sea, which is something that you know, has been happening within the last few years, or the sense that China is looking to change a whole variety of things that have issues for the global commons. And I'm thinking here of internet sovereignty, for instance, where China has become very powerful international organizations. These are not just matters for China. They are matters for the wider world. And the liberal world at the moment actually does need to say more firmly and strongly, not just we have to engage with China, but actually we don't agree with your vision of the internet, for instance, or we don't agree with your militarization of the South China Sea and these are matters for us as well as for you. No, I think it's perfectly valid to offer a different view of the internet. Um, but no, I, I, I really found this analogy with Nazi Germany quite offensive. Actually, there's not, not remotely similar situation. And it, I mean, that kind of language tends to sort of poison the, 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 whole, the whole debate and isn't right. Um, and, and similarly to say, we would start our discussion of economic relationship, which was your question, by focusing on the issue of Xinjiang, it actually explains why we just run into this Cold War environment. Because, you know, th there is a debate about Xinjiang, we can, can have it, um, and it's probably pretty bad what's happening there. But if the Chinese were to say, okay, uh, we're not going to sit down with you in the United States and talk about trade unless you repeal section two of the American constitution that gives people the right to carry guns. We in China are very upset at seeing people being 
killed in, in America in shooting incidents, very upsetting. We don't like it. It infringes our idea of human rights. So you, you change your constitution, you define human rights the way we see it in China, and then we'll talk to you about trade. I mean, that, that is an obvious non-starter. Um, there is, of course, an issue about human rights, and we, we need to approach it carefully. And, you know, we clearly have very different values. But just making this your, your opening gambit, which is what the Biden administration has done, has effectively closed down the conversation. So your question is, what, what are they looking for, and how do we need to respond to it? Um, it seems to me that if you have two two countries of roughly equal economic size, and that most of the current measures, the World Bank, IMF, United Nations, suggest that China probably is now bigger in economic terms, purchasing power parity, then the Chinese have to be given a stake in running the system. You know, they're shareholding in the IMF, in the World Bank, um, their position in the World Trade Organization has to be treating them as an economic superpower, as part of the rule-making system. And they will be bloody-minded, and they will be very tough in negotiation, and they will do bad things. But at least they're part of the system, and that has now to be accepted. Uh, that, that's the first point. Sorry, you were interrupting me. Well, I was just going to ask you to expand on that point for a second. Isn't there a difference between being in the system and actually what is more and more evident, which is China's economic weight is giving it control over much of the system. You could argue that it's China's economic weight that's given it the right to do that, but the fact remains that levels of transparency, debate, discussion are much harder with China than they are with liberal actors in the system, simply because there aren't questions of independent judiciaries, media, and so forth, that whatever the faults of the United States or the UK yes, of course. do exist. No, of course it's difficult. I'm not trying to pretend it isn't, but that's the way we have to see it of integrating them into the system. Now, you, you chose the example of the South China Sea as an example of Chinese bad behavior. I didn't and, say it was bad or good, I just pointed out. Well, that. yes, I mean, two points to make about it. I mean, first of all, there is the breach of the law of the sea, which they, they've done. They, um, they would not accept the rulings in relation to the Philippines. Um, it's slightly undermined by the fact that the Philippines accepts has renounced its own victory in that legal case. Uh, and also, of course, the United States is not a signature of the law of the sea. So we're in a slightly sort of weak territory here. But as far as militarization is concerned, I mean, Michael is much more knowledgeable about this than I am. But you know, the, the two facts that, that struck me very strikingly, the United, that China spends 2% of its GDP on defense. It's the same as the UK, it's the NATO target. This is not the Soviet Union, which was devoted its economy to militarization. You know, upper Volta with rockets was what it was described as. That's not the Chinese system. And if you're looking at overseas expansion, um, the United States has, I think, 200 international bases. I, I don't have a problem with that. They're mostly doing good. The Chinese have Two, two. You know, they have one in, in, in the Indian Ocean in Pakistan, another in Djibouti. Maybe they're getting another one, I don't know. But th this is not a, you know, a, a global military expansion. The, the Chinese, f the focus of all their policy domestically is economic. Economics rules in China, and they, they, they want to be part of the world economy, and we have to find a way of integrating them into the rule system. Well, That's can I put, put that to, to, to Michael in a different form? Because a phrase that everyone now recognizes, which no one had heard of 10 years ago, is Belt and Road Initiative. Now, we all know that the Chinese infrastructure project, and it's not top down, in some ways it's quite provincial and has different parts to it, has lots of flaws. Debt diplomacy, many of the projects that are sponsored by Chinese um, infrastructure payments aren't always um, either very well built or very stable. But the Belt and Road Initiative overall has provided a whole variety of infrastructure capacities to South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia, which the Western world simply hasn't provided a sensible sort of response to. So what is there that the liberal world can say when Malaysia comes along and says, we want fast rail, when the Ethiopians say that we want a light uh, rail metro in Addis Ababa, when the Argentinians say our internet system is breaking down, we need someone to provide 5G. 
why doesn't the West have a better answer to those perfectly legitimate questions being asked by those countries which the Chinese are answering? Well, I answer it with two points. The first is the West does have a response. Uh, it's starting. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in itself is not evil. It's the way that the standards created, whether it's labor or environmental or other standards, were built into uh, loan agreements by, especially by the World Bank and the regional banks. The Chinese managed to undermine all of that, to use a fancy word, conditionality that had been negotiated for previous decades. Um, they say they're star sorry, they didn't have time, they're willing to consider putting standards in, but they're really not. Secondly, there's only one head of state who opposed the Belt and Road. He refused to come to the summit in Beijing. The Americans at least sent an NSC staff member, Matt Pottinger. Do you care to answer who was the head of state who opposed the Belt and Road Initiative? I'll give you a clue. You mentioned, you mentioned you're from Calcutta. Yeah, I'm guessing it's Narendra Modi. I'm guessing right. Why did India oppose the Belt and Road? And others have joined more quietly, not publicly. They want some of the money, but not to allow the violation of sovereignty that seems to go on with Belt and Road loans. So, I mean, in, in that sense, so how, does, how, does, how does that answer the Argentinians so, so, who want, um, want their 5G provision? It, there? it doesn't. It doesn't. China is going to expand globally with its model. It's doing very well. Many people love it. They love it. What the Americans are starting to do, and actually it began under President Obama, the Americans are starting to say, no, you can't do it this way. You can't do it this way. You're violating too many norms, too many rules that date back 100 or even 200 years in society. The Chinese are saying, yes, we can. No one's going to stop us. One of my favorite Chinese expressions is, Ni you cannot contain us. You don't have the power to stop what we're doing. The Chinese are right. The political will, the self-induced paralysis, the American China experts who have these vicious fights over is China an offensive Nazi Germany kind of place, or no, it's a the dancing with the dragon is a good thing for you. We have these self-inducing paralysis debates and the result is very little is being done to stop the implementation of the China model. What has been done seems to have an effect. The trade talks, Chinese at first, they were not coming to Washington. They're not gonna be any trade talks. Pressure was applied, they came. Then we learned from the Chinese delegation, some of the American demands are what Chinese reformers themselves want to do. Banning technology sales in certain sectors starts to have an effect. We can begin to see, looking back since the Obama years, there are some kinds of pressure on China that work. They understand pressure. 2,500 years of statecraft. But we haven't mounted enough pressure yet. And the worst part of it is, Rana, hypocr hypocritical comments. If you say genocide is occurring in China, you simply can't treat the government as a normal government and go to the Olympics. The guts to stop the Olympics is not there. So whoever started saying genocide in the beginning, that's a, speaking of offensive words, that's pretty offensive to say that China commits genocide. Apparently nobody has a dead Uyghur who is killed through some kind of uh, deliberate mechanism. It's a re-education program that has a lot of violations of human rights but it's not like the Holocaust. So why use this kind of rhetoric about China? And Steve Bannon, by the way, is one of my favorite users of rhetoric against China, that it's the worst country in human history, this kind of thing. By the way, we invest one trillion American dollars in China through our New York Stock Exchange. We invest hundreds of billions in private equity We've had almost unlimited technology transfer sales to China for 40 or 50 years. This is not a, a Hitler country or a genocide country that's very friendly with us. So we're trying to start a very low level of pressure to see whether China will eliminate or cut back 
some of these egregious practices, things are still at a very, I would go like this, Rana. This is the level of pressure we could apply to China. This is the maximum level. We're nowhere near the maximum. The Chinese are already thinking, gee, the Americans are upset. They've got some supporters here at the Oxford Union Society. <laughs> what more might the Americans try and should we try to meet some of their demands? So I believe we're in a productive period now of conversation, but it's very tense. And when Joe Biden made an obvious invitation to Xi Jinping, look, I want to meet, I'm president now. I'm not just vice president, I'd like to meet you. What did Xi Jinping say? No, thank you. Although we do understand a virtual summit is now being uh, cooked up and may will be happening in the next few weeks, so that may yet uh, may yet change. In real life is, a, is another another question. I think we can da dance with the dragon while they're stealing your wallet. <laughs> Well, of course, that wallet has been filled with the uh, Chinese buying American T-bills for quite some decades. So it does go, go both ways. But I think there's a danger even of a bit of agreement breaking out here. Let me put a UK dilemma to you, if I may, um, Vince, which combines questions of economics and values. We, the UK, are now looking for a post-EU future. Clearly, there is a great deal of interest, in particular in our financial services industry, having connections with China and Rishi Sunak. The Chancellor, amongst others, has at least implied there's an interest in boosting London's role in this area. However, the example that many, many people have been pointing out is that of Australia. Like us, you know, a medium-sized, medium-powerful, liberal state in the Anglophone world. And having tied a great deal of their economic star, particularly in terms of uh, exports to China, Australia has found that its ability to say what it wants at home, in particular the case of Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, talking about the need potentially for a COVID investigation, has led to very harsh economic sanctions against Australia as a result. Now, the effects of those haven't turned out to be perhaps quite as damaging as was expected at the beginning, but it did send a message out that essentially the price of doing a trade deal with China is essentially that you have to shut up about China if you're not going to say something nice. I'm not sure that's something that a kind of loudmouth liberal nation like the UK could really stand, do you think? Well, actually, uh, the first time I went to negotiate with the Chinese on trade in 2010, uh, with uh, Cameron and company, we, we met the president, Hu Jintao, and his team, and one of the issues on the agenda was Tibet. Um, we asked the Chinese, we say, we're going to raise this. People in Britain feel very strongly about it. Uh, we're going to raise the issue. They said, fine, but we'll do this in a proper way. You say something about Tibet. We'll say something that you don't like for five minutes. Um, you put out your press releases, we put out ours and then we can talk business. So, I mean, if things are done in a structured way, the Chinese are perfectly able to cope with. But what uh, you tell is different from Xi Jinping, isn't it? Xi Jinping clearly is a much more confrontational sort of politician. Well, we, Trump we, than we don't know. Right? We haven't had that kind of exchange with them. But, I, but your particular question was about the UK. And I would say that the fact that we, you know, Brexit has happened, is an absolutely compelling reason why we now have to engage with China. If we'd wanted to just stick with countries that have the same values and the same standards, we should have stuck in the European Union. But we've, we've left. I mean, every, everybody, you know, particularly the Chinese, just regard it as an act of madness. But the fact that we've now left means we have very little alternative but to try and engage with the big growth economies of the future, which are India, China, Brazil, possibly Russia, and others. Uh, you know, we're in a new world, and we have to be pragmatic. Um, my experience, as you say, is, is that we, we, we have been able to talk about human rights issues. I, I, on the third occasion, I went as a minister, uh, in the Xi period, actually, um, and I raised with ministers, um, who is now in the Politburo, uh, the, the whole issue about labor rights in China. And I, I made the point to look, you know, you, you're a socialist country and workers don't have the right to strike. I'm, I'm representing a wicked capitalist country and our workers have minimum wages and trade union. Can you explain? And actually we had a very civilized discussion for half an hour. I sent him stuff on minimum wage enforcement and I noticed this under the common prosperity of President Xi, all these uh, reforms to the labor market are now being introduced in China. So 
I mean, it's a slightly satirical example, but you know, human rights can be, you know, you can engage with China in an intelligent way. You just shout at them. Of course, they take offense for perfectly obvious reasons. And that's why this stuff about genocide is so lethal. I mean, I, I, I have no idea what's happening in Xinjiang. I've seen, I've read the literature. Um, there clearly is a serious abuse of human rights, but I was very struck that The Economist magazine in the UK, which is very hot on human rights and very critical of China, said, we will not use the word genocide because it is clearly not applicable here. It's a bad use of language. The, when Pompeo originally made these accusations in the United States, his own lawyers in the State Department dissociated themselves from it. So, you know, if, let, let, if, if there is evil, let's use the right language for it. 